All right, so tonight we're going to cover the last three healing miracles that Jesus um, did. Obviously, and we're going to see uh, in one scripture here in Matthew, Jesus did thousands of healings. But the Holy Spirit specifically gave us 26 healings that are elaborated on. And those healings give us a lot of revelation on the healing ministry. Tonight's three healings are kind of unique. Uh, not only do they cover three different parts of the body, but none of the people that get healed tonight ask Jesus to heal them. And Jesus healed them anyway. In fact, one of them had a sword in his hand ready to kill Jesus if necessary. And Jesus healed him too. So it just goes to show the extreme compassion and love. And one of the things we'll see also is, uh, you know, Jesus could have avoided a lot of trouble if he didn't heal on Saturday. <laughs> if he would have just waited until Sunday, you know, he's just, you, know, you know what, he could have told the guy, look, come back tomorrow and the Pharisees will not be on my face and we'll heal you tomorrow. But Jesus was not only out to expose their religious nonsense, right. he was also willing to show, I'm not wanting this person sick one more day. And, and, and that's what another area that we battle in our minds for healing myself, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'll just wait till the next time they have a prayer meeting and then, you know, Jesus, Jesus wants you heal right now. Right. And, uh, you know, I think about the, um, I think about the uh, Pharaoh, and I think it's actually humorous, you know, when he says, Moses tells Pharaoh, he goes, listen, I'll give you the honor of telling me when you want all these frogs gone. Mm -hmm. And you remember the frogs were everywhere. They were in the kitchen, they were in the, in the, in the bedrooms, they were in the food, they were everywhere, man, and the place stunk of all the, all the frogs. Yeah. And Pharaoh goes, hmm, I, if I was Pharaoh, I would have said, get them out of here right now, you know. And what did Pharaoh say? He goes, how about tomorrow around noon? Uh, <laughs> it's like, what you, what you, why don't you just have the Lord remove them right now? And that, I think a lot of people are waiting for that, you know, mm -hmm. just maybe sometime later God will heal me. And Jesus was interested in healing right then that he was willing not even to wait one more day. So... <clears throat> um, so again, Jesus did many other miracles. We're going to look at the last of the 26 miracles tonight, three healings. And uh, again, there's going to be a lot of contention with these healings as there usually is. So, <clears throat> so as a way of review, um, we started out with the man that was covered with leprosy. And we started with him for the simple reason that we wanted to find out the Lord's willingness to heal. And when he said, are you willing to heal me? And the Lord said, yes, I am willing to heal. We saw the healing of the ten lepers, the paralyzed servant that was let through the, the roof. We saw the healing of the man that was sick of the palsy. We saw the the young boy that uh, had a bad fever where he was at the point of death. And that man, if you remember, he walked almost, what, like 20 miles to get to Jesus, to let him know. And Jesus just spoke the word and that boy was healed. Peter's mother-in-law was healed. The woman with the issue of blood was healed. The woman with the spirit of infirmity had been that way bound up. There was a spirit. Satan had bound her for 18 years, was healed. The infirm man, that was the longest one that we have recorded, 38 years, he was uh, afflicted and weak. At Bethesda was healed. We saw the three demonized mutes. Uh, all of the mutes were, were possessed by demons. That's why they could not speak. They were demonized. The deaf mute also was healed, and he had an impediment in speech. Jesus supernaturally gave him his speech. There was a man who had an unclean spirit that was in the synagogue that was healed. The man also who had the legion of demons was delivered, and the Syrophoenician's daughter uh, was healed. Uh, Jesus went all the way up to Syrophoenicia area, um, 
between Tyre and Sidon up there, he went all that far, 30, 40, 50 miles, just to do one healing, and then he came back. And we're going to see what he did when he came back from that healing. He does a, the, the greatest healing service ever, at least, at least in the ministry of Jesus, was, was right after the Syrophoenician's daughter was healed. Um, two weeks ago, we saw the four people that were... Uh, well, there was more because there was one set, set of blind people that were healed, but the four stories of the blind people were healed. And then last week we looked at the three people that were raised from the dead. So, before we get into the teaching, I want to go to Matthew chapter 15. Um, and I want to look at this healing service here. This is an awesome healing service. I mean, I wish I would have had a video camera. I wish we would have had YouTube back then to record all this. But I think, honestly, in a way, I'm glad it wasn't recorded because then it's going to be by faith and not by sight. And so we have to believe it. We have to receive it. But I want you to get a feel for how this healing service went. Matthew chapter 15. I'm going to begin reading with verse uh, 29. And so... Uh, the Syrophoenician's uh, daughter is healed. We know that uh, he came down so he would have walked somewhere between 35 and 50 miles to get back to the Sea of Galilee. So verse 29 says he departed from there. He was at Tyre, Zidon, and then came all the way down. So he was skirting the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on a mountain and he sat down there. And we know where he was because if you look at the last verse of this chapter, he was in the region of, of uh, Magdala or Magadan. If you have a translation that says Magadan, we know the area that he was in. And there's a mountain there that's about 3,000 feet high. So just think about this. So Jesus is there. All of these sick people start coming to him. And what does he do? He doesn't stay down there and minister healing. He takes off and he goes all the way to the top of a mountain. And not only does he go to the top, he sits down. He, when he gets to the top of the mountain, he sits down. We know what the mountain looks like. It's still there right now. We know what the mountain looks like. So he went all the way to the top of this mountain. And all the sick people are down there. So all the sick people are looking around. <laughs> and they're maimed. you, you got a picture. There's people there that are crippled. Because it says there, a great, then great multitudes. In fact, that becomes the key word all the way through this, great multitudes. Verse 31 says the multitude. Verse 32 says, I have compassion on the multitude. Uh, verse 33, there was such a great multitude. Verse 35, he commanded the multitude. And then finally, uh, verse 36, he says he gave to the multitude. And we realize then, as we get to verse 38, that there was at least 4,000 men. And on top of that, there were children and women that were there. And then he said he sent away the multitude. So multitude. So there was thousands of people there, and they were sick. Okay. So it says, verse 30, then a great multitude, they came to him. They were down at the base of the mountain, and they went all the way up that mountain, 3,000 feet. Okay. They were lame, they were blind, they were mute, they were maimed, and many others. Okay? So you can imagine people that are crippled walking up and having others help them. And perhaps they were some people were carrying these people. Can I tell you what I see in all that? And, and the Bible doesn't say this, so I'm just kind of giving you what I think of that. I think the Lord is wanting to see who really wants to be healed. <laughs> because you're not going to carry crippled people up 3,000 feet. And the wording here where it says they laid them down at Jesus' feet, they were so exhausted when they finally got up to that mountain, they just, they just threw the guy, <laughs> they just threw the guy, maimed, lame, whatever, at the feet of Jesus. So they were so exhausted. And Jesus is like, I, I would have said, Jesus, why are you making this so hard? <laughs> you could have just stayed at the bottom of the mountain. And would have solved all of this. But boy, those people really wanted to be healed. And it shows me 
the desperate, desperate desire that's in people to want to be healed. We're willing to do anything to get to Jesus. And the wording there where it says they laid them down is a wording they say basically they just threw them right there. And probably the people that were carrying all these sick people. And you can imagine the blind, they didn't get up that mountain by themselves. They were, they were holding on to people as they were walking up. And there were mute people there. And what does it say? He healed them. And that whole multitude was amazed. They marveled when they saw the mute speaking. The maimed were whole. The lame were uh, walking. The blind came seeing. And they were glorifying the God of Israel. That was an awesome service. Up on top of this mountain. Well, this service went on for three days. Three days on top of a mountain. We know that's true because verse 32 says, Now Jesus called the disciples himself. I have compassion on this multitude because they have now continued with me for three days and they've had nothing to eat. Obviously on the top of a mountain, they don't have food stands up there or a restaurant or any food. And he goes, I don't want to send them away hungry lest they faint along the way. And even the disciples said to him, verse 33, where, where are we going to get enough food to feed all these people? This is a, we're out in the middle of nowhere, and there's this great <laughs> multitude. So here's the next miracle Jesus post performs. They, he says, how many loaves of bread do you have? And they say, well, we just have seven and a few little fish. And so Jesus commands them, and you know the story then after that. He multiplies all of this. And in the end, there's so much food left over that they have fragments left over. And, and so we know that there were thousands of men, 4,000, at least 4,000 men. And if, if everybody, if there was one woman for every man and one child for, for, for every, everyone, and there was probably more, there was at least 12,000 people on top of that mountain. And they were there for three days. And can you imagine when it turned night and it was dark? They all went to sleep there, and the next morning they got back up, and the next people got in line to get healed because it was thousands of people to be healed. So I did some calculations, and if you read my teaching on the healing ministry of Jesus, I talk about that there. If he healed one person every 30 seconds or so, you know, four or 5,000 people got healed, you know. And so... But that would have been awesome. Everybody, everybody coming was healed. Nobody was left unhealed. So, do we know all these stories? We don't know. Thousands of people were healed. And the Bible just puts it in here that they were all healed. And I love the Greek text because the Greek text... It's kind of like a rhyming thing. The chulos, the tuflos, the kulos, the kofos, and the hurtos, and the pus. <laughs> Not the cholos, but the chulos. <laughs> but the us, the, 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 the chulus, and the tufus, and the kulus is all plural. That there was many of them. That's what those all mean. The heteros, tu, pulos means the lame, many lame, many blind, many maimed, many mute, and many others. There was other people that came there probably that had other conditions that we they don't even know about. But they were all, all the cholos were healed. <laughs> headband or no headband, they got healed. Baggy pants or no baggy pants, they got healed. So, the bottom line is, again, we see Jesus' willingness to heal. Jesus' desire that, that people be healed. And I, I just can't get over this. The, it doesn't make me mad. It grieves me that so many in the body of Christ don't want to trust the Lord for healing, that they don't believe in it. And I just, somebody was showing me the other day on their phone, just even Christians saying how all of this is demonic, you know, that... that for you to be healed, that's like a demonic thing. And, and tongues is demonic and, and spiritual gifts are demonic. How did that happen? We have gifts of the Spirit in the Word of God and they're calling it demonic. When people are, are, are hungry for 
the things of God and revival and healing and deliverance and victory and we're telling people it's demonic? Where did that? That's demonic. That's what I say. But what an awesome thing that people were so enraptured with Jesus and what he was doing that they didn't even want to eat. And I don't know. Again, like I said before, if I was there, I, I'm, I'm fasting for three days. I, I want to see the miracles. I want to see Jesus heal people. I think those people were rejoicing because it says they were glorifying the God of Israel. They must have had a hallelujah hoedown up there on top of that mountain. Just They must have stopped and started praising God and praising Jesus. Healing doesn't bring the devil into it. It brings glory to Jesus. People are going to worship Jesus when they get healed. And even if they, even if they get healed and they run out of here, at least we see the glory of God, because people are going to do that. You know, we saw that with the lepers. You know, there's people that are going to get their healing, and they're going to be gone. But it's going to testify to the healing power of the Lord. That doesn't negate the fact that He heals, and He's the healer. So, in today's message, we're going to look at three, these final three people of the 26. The man with the dropsy, the man with the withered hand, both of those healings there are contested by the Pharisees because it was done on the Sabbath. And then we're going to see the reattachment of Malchus's ear. It, the dropsy, probably the, pro, the problem there was with his feet. The man with the withered hand, of course, was his hand. And then the reattachment of Malchus's ear was uh, another part of the body. So we see Jesus healing all parts of the body. And that was an awesome thing, too, to have all these soldiers about 600 of them came to get Jesus. And uh, the Spirion, I uh, would call it the Spirion. And um, <clears throat> wasn't it awesome when all those 600 soldiers came and Jesus said, who are you looking for? And he said, in Greek, I am. And all 600 of them fell down like that when he said, 600 soldiers fell down. And then... Peter, being the smart Peter that he is, whips out a sword, <laughs> cuts the guy's ears off, ear off, you know. But that must have been awesome. I, I wonder how those soldiers were reacting because it was after that that he got arrested. I wonder how those soldiers reacted as he reached down and picked up this ear <laughs> and this guy is bleeding, you know, off of it. And he reattaches the whole thing. I wonder, I wonder how that felt for those guys, you know. That this is what this is who they're coming to arrest is Jesus the healer. So let's go here to Luke chapter 14. And let's look at this man with the drop seat. This is the only place in the Bible that this, this is mentioned. There's uh, none of the other gospel writers. And once again, as we've been saying, Dr. Luke makes observations, and we're going to see that again tonight. He's going to notice things, and in fact, he's, he's going to be the only one that records that this ear reattachment took place. None of the other people, the other people that just said he cut off his ear, but Luke says, oh, by the way, he did pick up his ear and reattach it, because Luke was watching out for it because he was a doctor. And so there's things that Luke says that none of the other gospel writers say. And uh, being a doctor, he was watching out for stuff like that. Okay, so Luke chapter 14. Let's read the first six verses here. And again, we have this contention, which we're going to talk about in a little bit about the Sabbath. Now it happened as he went into the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath that they, were, that they watched him closely. I just want to say right now, I would not go to the house of a Pharisee and eat on the Sabbath. <laughs> I would not because you know they're going to be evaluating you the whole time you're there. You're not even going to be able to enjoy the food because everybody's looking at you to see whether you touched the right thing, whether you said the right thing, whether you prayed the right thing, whether you, you washed the right pot. Man, I would hate to be in a Pharisee's house. Uh, but Jesus got invited several times to Pharisees' houses. Those are classic. They invited him. Every time they invited him. And, and they walk in, and of course, they're always critiquing him right away. They're, they're shocked. You didn't wash your hands? <laughs> I, no, I didn't wash my hands. I'm here to eat. <laughs> so, 
But isn't that sad? And that's when you know you're legalistic mm -hmm. as a Christian. Okay. When you walk into a church and all you're looking at is a carpet color and who's dressed that way and how loud the music. And when you're critiquing everybody and evaluating and judging everybody, you're legalistic. You're a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. But if you're there for people, and you're there to love people, and you're there to hug people, and show compassion on people, and minister to people, that's the heart of Jesus. You know, we're not here to evaluate how people are looking. Uh, that one young man that came Sunday, he wore a long sleeve shirt, the guest that came, and he told me, he says, Pastor, he goes, I have so many tattoos. And I go, welcome to the club. <laughs> and half our church has tattoos from the head to the foot. And he laughed and he he like relaxed after that. Because he was so afraid of what we were gonna say to him. I go, brother, relax. And Robin was sitting right back here. And I told Robin, Robin, stand up. <laughs> I, and he went and sat, the guy sat down, but I said, just relax, dude. It's all right. So if we just focus on people and not their tattoos and how they came in and what kind of stuff they're doing, just love on them, we'll get to the truth eventually to talk to them about the truth. So, anyway, uh, I would not, I wouldn't want to be around a Pharisee on the Sabbath. That just, just, I wouldn't want to be in the house. I wouldn't want to be around them at all. It says, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answering spoke to the lawyers, the, these legal guys and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And notice this, they kept silent, they had nothing to say. And he took him and healed him. It doesn't say how, it just says he healed him. And he let him go. Then he answered them and said, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So be part of your homework to notice that Jesus says this same statement over and over to this Sabbath question. He goes, hey, if an animal falls into a pit, won't you guys help it out? And of course they would, and so that, that shut them up. So, um, all right. <clears throat> if you... We, we have to get, I think it will give you a lot of insight as to what's happening here if you back up a few chapters and begin to read what's going on between Jesus and the Pharisees. But a very bitter feud is taking place, particularly from the Pharisee side and, the, and the, these lawyers. They're, they were not attorneys, right? That, that's a, a term for, like they were experts in the law of Moses. They were people that were theologians, that they knew every jot and tittle of the law. And if you violate it, they could quote Leviticus chapter 18, verse 32, the second part of the verse, you violated that verse. You know, so these guys were there to nitpick. And that's what it says. They watched him closely. They were there to judge Jesus to see if he was going to do one single thing wrong, not according even to the law of God, but according to their tradition. And... Jesus nails them. Oh, man, when you get to Luke 11 there, I have it, verse 37 through 54. Woe to you, Pharisees. Woe to you, lawyers. Woe to you guys, because you're, you're just so caught up in all of your religious stuff. So Jesus blasts them. I mean, literally blasts them. If you go back and read the last verses of Luke 11, man, he says, woe to you, you killed the prophets. Woe to you. You, and he even tells them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, you know. Woe to these lawyers. You take away the key of knowledge and you're hindering people from getting close to God. And um, he goes, all you're worried about is the cup and the dish. You're not concerned about the things on the inside. He said, he called them fools, you foolish people. So, Jesus blasts them and so... So we have to have that background, and I think a lot of commentators caught it. This, these Pharisees were not inviting him over as a friend, sit down and have dinner with us. This was a trap. This was a trap to spring on Jesus. And, I, and I, it doesn't say this again, so this is just some thoughts here. I think that they had that man there just to see if he would heal 
on the Sabbath day. I think they went and got him and put him to sit down and sit down for dinner here. But they were, he wasn't there. To, they were there as a trap to trap Jesus. Because there's no way these, these were the rulers of the, this guy was the ruler of the Pharisees. I mean, this guy was one of these, the main, a big shot guy. And so this was all a setup. And that's why Jesus right away, he gets right on it. And he says, hey, is it lawful to heal them? He knows, he knows, he's already exposed their trap. And he knows what uh, they're up to. And for them, doing a miracle was working. And so this, this guy all of a sudden, behold, he shows up. No, he didn't just show up. They had him planted there. But Jesus goes in. Even though there's this trap set up, Jesus goes and heals them in. He, that's not what he's there. Jesus is going to go ahead and bless him. So isn't it sad, though, that as you read the Old Testament, there was a very strict requirement on keeping the Sabbath, but it was a day of rejoicing and rest. It was a time to cease from all activities. That's what Sabbath means, cease, to stop, and reflect on the goodness of God. The Sabbath was made to benefit and bless man. But the Pharisees had made it into a curse. They could not celebrate this man's healing because they were so interested in critiquing Jesus and judging him. At the end of verse 2 there, it says that this man had dropsy. And it's the same word as, it's the same uh, term and it means the same as edema. So this person had swelling. Doesn't say where. Mostly where people have swelling is in their hands, their arms. But a lot of it, because of the position of your body, it goes down to your feet. And I know that you guys know that. You've seen pictures of people, or you've seen people yourself walking around, and they have really large swollen uh, leg. And you can tell, especially when you push your finger in there and you move your finger out, it leaves an indent there in their leg or their arm. So I got this from the Mayo Clinic. It says edema is swelling caused by excess fluid trapped in your body's tissues. Usually it's because of congestive heart failure. That's a big one. Your heart does not work enough. You gotta take water pills so you can urinate so it gets the water out of your system. Kidney disease or cirrhosis of the liver. Now the word dropsy there is the Greek word. Hudro, hudro is the word for water. And that's where we get the word hydrogen, uh, hydroelectric plant, all the, all the hydraulic, all those words come from hudro. Hudro is water. Pictos means to look. So this person looked watery. <laughs> and, well, he was swollen. That's what it's basically saying. He was swollen up, and that was the person that was there. How many people struggle with that nowadays? Yeah. With dropsy. There's a lot of people. My neighbor, the neighbor right behind us, we talk a lot to him. His one leg is swollen like three times the other leg. And it's real, real red. His circulation is really poor. So we try to do stuff for him. So, But you, you see so many people struggling with that affliction. And um, Jesus healed it. Let's go to the top of page 68. And I want to emphasize this. G Again, I would have I would have waited till the next day, you know, <laughs> just not to cause any problems with the Pharisees. I, I, I'll just heal you on Sunday. Come back Sunday, and I'll heal you, and that way we don't cause any problems. We won't offend these Pharisees. No, Jesus went ahead. He took the man, healed him, and he let him go. He wasn't willing to wait one more day. He's going to heal now, even if it meant being blasted by the Pharisees and the law experts. So what's the answer? Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Yes, it is. It's lawful to heal on the Sabbath. It's lawful to heal any day. <laughs> and anyone can do good on the Sabbath. What happened when, when this took place? They kept silent. They could not say a word. So verse 4, they kept silent. Before the healing, after the healing, they still had nothing that they could answer. And you know what I say is, if you all you have is an argument, you can keep your argument. I want the healing. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. And they had nothing that they could say 
And I believe we're going to cover that in one of the next healings, where um, uh, in the book of Acts, you remember when they healed the man that was laid by the beautiful gate? Uh, that's what it says there. They could say nothing because the guy was running around, jumping up and down. He was healed. There's, it said there's a notable miracle. We can't deny it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to say, people. Hey, you don't believe in healing? Well, there's a notable miracle, miracle that's taking place. And no one can deny it. So Jesus healed him and let him go. He says, you know, I wonder if Jesus whispered in your ear, you better get out of here. These Pharisees don't like this. <laughs> you were here as a plant. Just go out. Go Go ahead and go. So he let him go. He says right there. He let him go. go. Just leave. Uh, it's better to get out of this place of unbelief and hard-heartedness than to stay here. But isn't it something? Jesus appeals to simple common sense and logic. They show compassion to animals. Why not humans? Mm -hmm. And isn't that the, the darkness that we live in today? That people can, people can go to such extremes to save a rare squirrel. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll abort a baby. Yes. You know what I mean? We've got to save those porpoises. We've got to save those porpoises. We don't want them to become extinct. And then they'll kill a baby in the womb. But it just goes to show the darkness and we have rejected God because here is man who's made in the image of God and they're willing to go out and save an animal but not save a life. And it shows again the hard-heartedness of people. And that's why Jesus appeals to this. Hey, if you guys will do this for animals and you will immediately take care of them. That's what it says. Immediately you'll pull them out on the Sabbath day. Why don't you do that for people who are human? Why don't you do that? And I want to say that too about the healing ministry of Jesus when we have doubts about it. Hey, you're willing to do something to help. If you see an animal or a dog or a cat suffering, you're going to take it to the veterinarian, to the doctor, put a little splint or whatever, or get the shots or whatever. You don't want to see the, dog, the animal suffering. If you're willing to do that for an animal, how much more somebody made in the image of God? You want the healing too. And so, again, it just shows the desire, the positiveness here of the healing. All right, so that's, that was the first one, this man with the dropsy. Let me ask you this question. Did this man come to Jesus pleading, begging Jesus to heal him? There's no indication in this text whatsoever. In fact, it just says there was a certain man that came before him. And it was Jesus that initiated the whole conversation. And it was Jesus that did the healing. He didn't wait to ask the guy. He didn't ask him, let's see if you have enough faith. He went ahead and healed the man right there. And again, we're going to see that in the next man, the next healing too. Let's go here to Mark chapter 3. Let's go to Mark's gospel. Mark the third chapter, and again, we're going to read the first six verses. This, this was a really awesome miracle. I would have loved to have been there to see a man with a withered hand. We will, you will also find this story in Matthew chapter 12, verses 9 through 14, and in Luke, Dr. Luke will... Uh, talk about it, chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. And Luke says things about it there that give us insight too, which we're going to quote from. <clears throat> Again, you'll see Dr. Luke has a real eye for what's healed, parts of the body that are healed. He notices things that the other writers don't. Um, so let's talk here about this man with the withered hand. Mark chapter 3, verse 1, he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And you know who else is there. <laughs> verse 6, we know they're Pharisees. So they watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. There it is again. 
And so for me, as we, we're going to summarize these healings on Sabbath, what I call Sabbath healings, we're going to see, I think Jesus did it deliberately and intentionally just to expose their religiosity. Mm -hmm. he, didn't, he, he could have done it outside. He didn't have to wait till the Sabbath. He could have done it on, on Thursday. But he waited in these circumstances to bring healing to people because he was wanting to expose things. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, did the withered man say anything? The man with the withered hand, did he say anything? No, Jesus talked to him. Step forward, he commanded him. Boy, he was bold. The wording there, the Greek imperative verb, step forward, come here. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And we're going to focus in on that word kill, which the other gospel writers use as destroy. But what again? They kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, he was in red. Jesus was angry, orge, the, the wrath. He was grieved by the hardness of their hearts. So he said to the man, again, the man did not ask to be healed. Jesus commanded him, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. How, what did the Pharisees do? Verse 6, then they went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So we're going to see how the Pharisees answered this question by their actions. Is it lawful? On the Sabbath to do good or do evil? Is it, is it good to save life or to destroy life? They determined that on the Sabbath we want to destroy life. We want to destroy Jesus. That's what they said. They want to destroy him. Verse 6. So isn't that terrible? Isn't that utterly terrible? That people are there. They see a miraculous healing. And all they can do is a plot to try to destroy Jesus. That is the blindness of man and religious man uh, in the way they view the Lord. Those are the hardest people to win, by the way, to the Lord. You guys know that. So there was a man there, the different translations say he had a withered hand, a shriveled hand, a deformed hand, or a crippled hand. Well, something was definitely wrong with his hand. It was probably all gone. And it was his right hand. How do we know that? Luke noticed that it was his right hand. <laughs> He wrote down, it was his right hand that was withered. I don't think this does that here, does it? Stretch out your hand. Right, so Luke says it was his right hand. So you can see Dr. Luke, he's, he's noticing all these things. It's the right hand. And the Greek word there for shriveled, withered, means to be dried up. So somehow it was all dried up. I don't know what, whether it was completely gone or it was just totally crippled. Uh, if you look at Hebrews 11.2, it talks there about by faith that the Israelites cross the Red Sea as if on dry land. That's the same wording that's here for withered. So somehow it was all dried up. His hand was just completely uh, uh, withered away. So apparently to the Pharisees, healing was considered work, right? Because they said that in verse uh, 2. They watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath day because they wanted to have a reason to accuse him. So they were so hard-hearted in their devotion to their traditions that they could not rejoice in a miracle. The truth is they became enraged. We're going to see that in just a few slides here that they became really angry. So they were watching him closely to accuse him. And Jesus, I love it, because, as you know, being in an environment like that, where there's, you know, because if you're being watched and critiqued and judged, there's intimidation there. Oh, yeah. You know, you're, you're being intimidated. Like, yeah. you do anything and they're going to jump on you. Right. That's intimidation. And Jesus just blows all that right out the door. <laughs> Step forward. Stand up. Get right here. There's no messing around with Jesus. Right. And Luke indicates that too in Luke 6, 8. Get up. Stand here. 
we're going to heal you right now. There's no messing around. There's no hesitation in Jesus about doing this healing. He is going to do it no matter what these religious clowns are going to say. Top of page 69. So Matthew's version says this, Matthew 12. Here's what he tells these guys. It's not recorded here in Mark, but it's recorded over in Matthew. What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Do you remember the woman that was bent over for 18 years? Guess what? She was healed in the synagogue. She was healed on the Sabbath. <laughs> So there were people there ready to pounce, right? And do you remember the ruler of the synagogue? The minute that lady was healed, you can heal all the other days, but not on Saturday. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <sighs> and what did Jesus tell him in Luke 13, 15? He goes, which one of you, if you have an animal and it falls into a pit? Jesus, Jesus kept using the same story over and over and over again. Because it was so simple. It was so common sense. Luke 6, 9 says, Is it lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus asked him this. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy? And what did they do? They wanted to destroy. They didn't want to save life. They didn't want to see anybody heal. They want to hold on to their doctrines and their beliefs and make sure Jesus is rejected. But they kept silent. They said nothing. No one said a word. The people said nothing to answer him. They had nothing to say. What can you say? The guy is healed. And I would have been, if I was there, I said, praise the Lord, man. I came and got my healing. I, you can keep your traditions. I came to get my healing. So he got his healing. And this is the only place where we're told specifically of the anger of Jesus. And it's the word orge. Wrath. It's every a lot of other places. Mostly, whenever it's used in the New Testament, it's the word wrath. So this really, really got to Jesus that they were this hard-hearted. And the Bible says here he was grieved by the verse five by the hardness of their hearts. That really grieved Jesus that they couldn't see the healing of this man just because of their traditions that they were wanting to maintain. So he was greedy. He was deeply disturbed by their stubbornness. The Pharisees were stubborn, stubborn people. Once again, Jesus commanded the man to be healed. What did he say? Stretch out your hand. All the, trans, all the different uh, uh, gospel writers use that phrase. Stretch out your hand. Just commanded it. A Greek imperative verb. Matthew 12, 13 says it. Luke 6, 10 says it. Stretch out your hand. And the man did his part. He stretched it out. Somehow he just opened his hand up and it was totally healed. <laughs> the immediate healing drew an immediate response from the Pharisees. They plotted not only for themselves, but they went and talked to the followers of Herod, who are the Herodians there, verse 6. And they made a plan to destroy Jesus. Matthew 12, 14 says they started plotting to destroy the Lord. Luke, in Luke 6, 11, observed they were filled with rage. Wow, isn't that something? Here a man gets healed, and all it does is it fills him with rage. And it wasn't the man's healing that enraged him. It was that Jesus was doing this on the Sabbath, and they got enraged. Wow, what a terrible... I, I pray that I will never be that hard-hearted <laughs> where I would be so blind to be enraged when people are being blessed and because of jealousy in me or something that I would be enraged at somebody's blessing. So, notice how many healings were done on the Sabbath. The woman with the spirit of infirmity, Luke 13. The man at the pool Bethesda, John 5. The man with an unclean spirit, Mark 1. The man who was born blind, John 9. The man with the dropsy, Luke 14. And now this man with a withered hand. 
And in each case, if you go back and study those healings, they were all got really upset with Jesus. They never rejoiced in a single miracle. They never rejoiced that people were being healed. In fact, they sat there and argued with the people that were being healed. They argued with Jesus. And isn't this something, as I, I went back today and I went back and reviewed the previous 23 healings that we've covered, and I noticed how many times people jumped on Jesus and it was all the religious crowd. It was the people that were in the synagogue, in the temple, that had the very words of God right in front of them that were opposing him. When he, remember when he, he told that one guy that came through the roof, he said, not only, he says, not only are, are you going to be healed, he goes, but I'm forgiving you right now. Boy, they jumped on Jesus for saying that. He's blaspheming. When he cast out devils, remember? It? Oh, that's Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. When he raises Lazarus from the dead, they went and plotted to kill Lazarus. Why? Because there were Jews that started following Jesus, all because of Lazarus. So, I want to tell you, to this day, the healing ministry is always going to be opposed. It will always be opposed by the devil. He'll always put it in your mind. Don't step out. Don't do that. Don't lay hands on anybody. You can't do anything. You're not going to help anybody. Don't pray for anybody. Don't do any of that all because the enemy wants to oppose the healing ministry. But when you hear that voice in your mind, not do it, just get right up and go out and do it. <laughs> just step out in faith because the healing ministry is always going to be opposed because people might start getting saved and that's what the devil doesn't want. Another thing that I wanted to just summarize here and as we're covering this, these, we've covered these 26 healing miracles, was the go tell nobody. <laughs> um, I still haven't got my arms, even though you guys gave some good answers, I haven't got my arms around why he does that each time. Uh, with a lot, not each time, but with a lot of people. Notice how often he, he said this. Matthew 8, 4, see that you tell no one. Mark 1, 44, see that you say nothing to anyone. Luke 7, 36, then he commanded them that they should tell no one. Matthew 9.30, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, See that no one knows it. Mark 8.26, Neither go to the, into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. Mark 5.43, But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. And then in Luke 8.56, He charged them to tell no one what happened. The reason I, I, I wonder about this is because there's other people that get healed that Jesus tells them, go home and tell your family. Right. Yeah. Go home right. and tell. And they, well, why did you tell the one guy not to do it? And then you tell this other guy to go do it. So, well, the Lord was doing the will of God, so we know he's perfect. And he was doing it all right. But it leaves us wondering why he had to say that to people. And, of course, if you're healed, you're going to go tell people. And if I'm healed, I'm going to go tell people for sure. So, they did. Okay, let's look at this last uh, miracle here. And this is the reattachment of Malchus's ear. Okay, and so let's... This is in all four Gospels. And I want to go to John 18. Because, again, I think this is humorous. If you go to Matthew 26 and read it, you go to Mark 14 and read it, you go to Luke 22 and read it, you're never told who swung the sword. And you're not told who the person is that got the ear cut off. But all of a sudden here in John, John spills the beans. It was Peter. <laughs> I think Peter said, man, why did you have to write my name? Nobody would have known who it was. <laughs> so, I want to go here because it tells us who it is. And again, if you go look at Luke's version, boy, Luke really exposes stuff that happened with Peter that are not in the other gospel writers. 
So let's just read it. And uh, again, I'm sure Peter uh, was regretting that his name was mentioned. <laughs> but Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cut off, notice this, his right ear. That's also something that Luke observes right away. Luke said it was the right ear. <laughs> it was the right hand and it was the right ear. And notice here he says the servant's name was Malchus. This is the only gospel writer that tells us who it is. So he tells us who did it, Simon Peter, and he tells us who the guy was that got the ear cut off, and it was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Um, <clears throat> by the way, if you here's another interesting fact which, well, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke's version, it never says that Jesus healed. I mean, uh, John's version here, sorry, Matthew and Mark, it doesn't say Jesus stopped to reattach the ear. Guess who, guess who does tell us? Dr. Luke. <laughs> Luke goes, yeah, he picked up the ear, reattached it, and healed him. So, if you read John 18, Matthew 26, Mark 14, it just says he cut the ear off. Yeah. And it's not until you get to Luke that says, oh, by the way, he, he, he touched the ear and he healed him up. Mm -hmm. And perhaps Jesus recreated the ear. Who knows? Because it doesn't say he picked it up. It was cut off. The Bible tells us all four times it was cut off. So it had to be there on the ground somewhere. But, the, but it says he touched the ear and it was healed. So maybe Jesus recreated the ear on his head. I don't know. <clears throat> the Bible doesn't tell us. So, <clears throat> so what does Matthew say? One of those who were with Jesus. Mark says one of those who stood by. Luke said one of them. So Matthew, Mark, Luke all write the servant of the high priest. So again, we're total anonymous. We don't know who did it. We don't know the guy's name that got hit. Matthew said he cut off his ear. Mark said he cut off his ear. Luke said he cut off his right ear. You see that again, Dr. Luke? He's noticing every detail of what happens. So here in John, we have the full detail. The one who had it, the one who did it was Simon Peter. And the servant of the high priest was Malchus. And it was his right ear that got cut off. Now... <clears throat> I don't know if Peter was having a bad day, but 600 people show up with swords and clubs. And the disciples, they only had two swords. <laughs> the Bible tells us that. Guess who tells us that? Luke does. They had two swords, and there's 600 people with swords and clubs. And Peter decides to whip out his sword. <laughs> you dummy, put the sword away. <laughs> What are you doing? Luke tells us that. Luke 22, 38, they had two swords. So. Hey, but Jesus permitted them to take a sword. That's an interesting. I asked the question in the homework. Why did he permit them to take swords? But Peter decided to use the sword at the worst possible moment. Satan was really sifting him as wheat. Uh, have you ever considered this? Um, that is that is pretty amazing that you could swing a sword and just cut off a person's yeah. ear. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, because normally you're swinging a sword, man. You're going for a head, or you're going for an arm, or something, and you're you're going to cut something. But to slice off just the ear, well. For me, it makes sense because the Roman helmets, the way they wore them, the thing that was exposed was the ear on the side. So probably Peter hit the guy on the helmet, ting, and it kind of went off to the side and sliced off his ear. So, because these were all soldiers, right? They were soldiers that all came. And so Peter was going for the head. Can you imagine what was happening with Peter? He was going to kill this guy. And if that guy didn't have the helmet on, he would have, he would have killed him for sure. Uh, but it, but somehow, 
whether he just kind of hit at an angle like that on the side of his head, it cut off the guy's right. Am I doing my right? Yeah, this is right. My right, the right ear. So Peter's really failing here. You know, he's he is um, uh, going to fall asleep in Gethsemane. <laughs> He's, he, he's the guy that said he was going to hang on to the end. If everybody else was to Jesus, he was going to be the guy hanging on to the end. And, and, and he's denying Jesus, and he's cutting people's ear off. And he just, he just, he is just out of control. Well, guess what? I love this. I, and I think, again, it's a... Well, it probably wasn't funny to Peter, but I think it's funny. Peter's sitting there denying... Remember when they said, you were with him. Yeah, you were with him. And finally, there's a guy there that was the cousin. Cuz, he's my cousin. There was a guy there that go, hey, by the way, my cousin got his ear cut off. And it was you. <laughs> and Peter still denies it, right? It says that, John 18, right here. You go to John 18, let's read it. I think it's funny. Here Peter's denying it. No, I wasn't there. I don't know Jesus. And here this guy, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative mm -hmm. of him whose ear Peter cut off. You go, man, you cut my cousin's ear off. I know it was you. <laughs> he goes, didn't I see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied it again. And immediately a rooster crowed. You know what I was thinking? I think the rooster got tired of Peter. <laughs> lying so much. I think the rooster said, cock-a-doodle-doo, -doo, it was you. I think the rooster probably said, man, I had it. That's the third time you lied to that girl. And man, you, you, I, the, pe the rooster got old, was had enough. And so the rooster finally said, man, I'm going to tell on you. <laughs> that was three. That was three right there. So that rooster... I don't know. Maybe I'm thinking too much. But can you imagine how Peter felt for years every morning when he heard a rooster crow? <laughs> every morning he wakes up, cock a doodle doo. And it reminded him when he denied Jesus. I bet there was no roosters near Peter's house. I mean, he killed off every rooster. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, I'm thinking too much. But I think about these things, and I, I, I don't know about you, but if there's certain, have you ever had certain things that happen and remind you of what something that happened long ago? Well, I think Peter got to regret all the cockadoodle doos. You know, when I come here in the mornings, there's roosters right over here where the sheep are over here, and they're going off, man, cockadoodle do so. I just pray I don't do anything dumb while a rooster's going on. <laughs> I'll live to regret it. <laughs> well, the only gospel writer that says Jesus reattaches Malchus's ears was Dr. Luke. Again, it doesn't tell us. It just says here, Luke says he touched his ear and healed him. Maybe he, he created a new ear. I don't know. The bottom line is he healed him. He touched his ear and healed him. None of the other gospel writers say that. And here's one of the things I want us to come away with from this. If Jesus heals a man who was his enemy, mm -hmm. how will he treat one of his friends? Right. Jesus right. healed even his enemies. Amen. Here's an enemy. Here's a guy that's coming with a sword to arrest Jesus. And Jesus goes ahead and shows grace and compassion towards this man and reattaches or recreates his ear. Jesus commands Peter, put away the sword. We saw it here in the Gospel of John. Put your sword away. I preached a message uh, many, many years ago, more than 20 years ago, called Put Away Your Sword. And it was about forgiveness and not pulling out the sword on your enemies. Jesus had to tell him, put it away. The Father had given Jesus a bitter cup to drink. 
But remember what we said last this past Sunday, right? God's will was above everything for Jesus. Mm -hmm. It was about yeah. the Father's will. And if he had to drink a bitter cup, he was going to drink the bitter cup. And of course, at Gethsemane and, and going to the cross, that was a bitter cup. But he was willing to do that above everything else. Perhaps again, Peter was standing in the way of Jesus doing what God wanted him to do. Matthew tells us, whoever uses a sword will perish by the sword. Mm. They want to use a sword. And that's true right in our own lives. We don't want to use a sword against people. We don't want to uh, come against people and cause problems for them or do evil for them. Because whatever you sow, you're going to reap. And if you use something to hurt people, that's going to come back to get you. So there's a valuable lesson here to learn that if you use the sword, it's going to be used on you. <clears throat> All right, so we're done now with the 26 healing miracles. And in the next lesson, when we pick it up in Acts, we're going to look at the first 12 chapters of Acts and primarily focus on Peter, but Philip the Evangelist did miracles, Stephen did miracles. There was just a lot of miracles going on, but we're going to focus on Peter, the first 12 chapters. And then in the second teaching, we're going to focus on Paul, who does many extraordinary miracles, casting demons out, healing sick, raising the dead, healing all these people on the island. He went to one island, Malta, and healed all the people that were sick there. It's a powerful healing ministry. And that's going to be a great transition for us, because we're going to go now from Jesus to his disciples doing the healing. And that's going to be a shift then, that you're going to see how they minister healing to God healing to people. And again, they're going to use the same things that Jesus did, only now they're going to use the name of Jesus to do the healing, which is what we uh, are to do. All right.